Knock on wood, this is the last set of pictures I'm drawing for titration curves. Polyprotic titrations, just so we get a quick glance at them. We've seen in the previous videos monoprotic titrations, so we'll just label this one. I'm just going to look at these acid plus some strong base. For our monoprotic one, we might have something like HCl. And we've seen this curve a bunch of times at this point. You get an increase in pH as the base is added, then you get that big jump, and then it plateaus as you just have excess base. And then we have this point right here that is our volume at the equivalence point. So this is whatever our volume at the equivalence point is. So we've seen that a bunch. Now what happens when we have polyprotic acids, things like H2CO3 or H3PO4. So we'll look at a diprotic example here. And I'm going to be very careful how I set this up because H2SO4 is special, and I don't want to put that one on this graph. So let's see what we can do for H2CO3. What is the difference we're going to see? Well, there's two H's to pull off. And a lot of times they'll say, like, stepwise ionization, removing these H's. And actually, that is what we see. And I kind of want to match that up to that distance right there. So if we look, that was about that far away, and then unsurprisingly, we're going to have that right there. And this may not be the world's greatest picture, but here we go. We're going to start out with our buffer region. Let me draw this up. We're going to start out with our buffer region as that first H gets pulled off, and then it's going to jump up through our equivalence point for that first H and then it's going to start a plateau, and then it's going to jump up again and plateau. And so as these points work out, this one here is the volume at the equivalence point that we had there as well. So this number and this number are the same. That's for pull, pulling that first H off. And then this one here is just 2 times the volume at the equivalence point to pull that second one off. It's one-to-one -one stoichiometry is how that works out. Then in terms of like buffer regions and things that we had discussed previously, we've got halfway to our equivalence point. This is VE over 2. Our pH is going to be equal to pKa1, the ionization constant for removing that first H. And then right here we have 3VE over 2, and that is pH equals pKa2, all right? And so our equivalence points, this will end up slightly basic, this will end up more basic. You might not even be able to see uh, both humps there because sometimes getting that second H off is really a challenge. Now let's look at a triprotic, and then we'll jump back and look at what H2SO4 would look like. All my markers are falling out here. Hopefully you can hear that. We'll look at a triprotic. Again, uh, we're working with a strong base here. For example, we'll say something like H3PO4. And this is theoretical because you really don't see the third H coming off in this. But as we're looking at these numbers here, we're going to see the exact same behavior. Only this time there's three H's to pull off. And so we're going to have the same shape we just saw in the previous picture. It'll start somewhere. You get a buffer region. It's going to jump up, buffer region, jump up, buffer region, and it just keeps going. Since we have these buffer regions and we just have um, three ages to take off, this point, this point, and this point are most going to be of interest to us because while we have pH equals pKa1 for the first, pH equals pKa2 for the second, and then pH equals pKa3 right there. And then in terms of volumes, this is the same equivalence volume that we had in both of those cases.
This is, just as we saw before, 2 times the equivalence volume. And then over here now, we have 3 times the equivalence volume. And so that's how that sets up. I don't know that it's worth it, but this is VE over 2, 3VE over 2, and 5VE over 2, where those happen. So you can use this type of data to figure out, like, knowing this is a buffer, if you see the two bumps there, you can predict, oh, it's diprotic or whatever. I have a lab that I have my students do where they have to identify, narrow down from five acids, which is which, based on titration curves and other data like that. I do want to mention one last thing, which uh, relates to diprotic acids. And this one, I just needed to draw in there, kind of ugly, but it's worth seeing, I guess. And that is for H2SO4. H2SO4 is kind of uncommon because it is a strong diprotic acid. So the first H for H2SO4 comes off very, very easily. And then after that, the second H isn't too bad. The second Ka is like 10 to the minus second or something. So you don't actually see both of these bumps. What you end up seeing is a curve that goes up a little bit like this. And you get your pH here. I'm just going to call that 7. So we go up. And then it jumps at that equivalence point and then tapers off. So because both of those H's are relatively easy to remove, you only end up with one point of inflection on that titration curve for H2SO4. Just an oddity as you're looking at that. But the really important part there is you're using two times the equivalence volume because you're taking off twice as many hydrogens. All right. So for a normal diprotic acid, you'd end up jump at the equivalence volume, then jump again the second time. For H2SO4, it titrates essentially so both H's come off at once, and that equivalence point happens at two times the equivalence volume.